Okay. Um, next talk is by uh, Rabon Kahensili, something like that, um, about uh, tracking systems or uh, booking systems. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, my name is uh, Ramon Kahensli. I'm here from the Zurich University of the Arts. Uh, we're a typical user of free software. This is some of the stuff that we use. Uh, but we also make our own free software, and one of those packages is called Lies. This is horrible to pronounce for someone uh, without German skills. Um, I like to claim that this is a multilingual recursive acronym. <laughs> but <laughs> that's all bullshit. It actually came from here. We just took the middle from that word. So uh, Ausleih system means borrowing system or lending system, something like that. Um, what's more important than what it's called is what it does. Uh, what does Lies do? Here we have a typical situation. This is funny LibreOffice clip art, by the way. I didn't invent that. Um, at an art university, you usually have different inventory pools or different departments with different equipment. Uh, I drew some, or I stole some pictures of Canon cameras here to represent that. And you have different types of students that have different types of permissions. And now in our case, uh, this guy, the fine arts student, he has access to one camera from the main building and nothing else. So the system lies, shows him that he can get one camera. Uh, the film student, she's uh, more powerful. She has more permissions because she studies film. Uh, she can also get that other camera and the expensive film camera next to that. And uh, Lies takes care of managing all the stupid, boring details about this process. So um, she can place reservations. Uh, the system takes care of the booking. The system takes care of approval or rejection of orders. Then you can print contracts. It displays opening hours for the different departments. It keeps track of the returns. Uh, it reminds users. And if it's not successful reminding users, it suspends the users. So, uh, and it does a million other things. So why did we start developing this on our own instead of taking something that exists? Uh, the problem was eight years ago, nothing existed. So we faced the choice of either developing our own or taking something that's proprietary. And the problem with the proprietary systems was that there wasn't anything that was geared at art universities or that sort of thing. They were all meant for rental companies that make a whole lot of money with this uh, equipment ordering. Um, and it seems that once we were actually done, when what we had was pretty successful because uh, even at just our university, we handle more than 15,000 reservations a year with the system. And uh, we know of several other universities that use it. Of course, it being FOSS, we are never sure who uses it, but this is what we know. Um, so I like to go back to why this was a success and why some people actually use the crap we build. Uh, but first, some mistakes that we made while uh, developing this. When I joined the team, we had inherited a whole lot of German code, looks like this. Uh, so in, in German, what might a show method be called? A show method in German looks like this, it's called Zeig. And um, now there's a problem if you don't write English code in an industry that uses English as its lingua franca, uh, you might as well write everything in Chinese. <laughs> or if that's too easy, you can try Finnish. I see there must be some Finns here. <laughs> okay, uh, or German. And this is actual code from the system that we inherited. So we had to get rid of all of that. Um, another problem was that if you use non-English code, you start confusing the libraries that you use that rely on language, even if that, that might be stupid. But um, in Ruby on Rails, you have this thing called pluralization and pluralization rules. And if you take a word like Gegenstand, it becomes Gegenstands. And that's idiotic because it's the correct plural is Gegenstände. But, and you, you can wrestle the system into doing this for you and giving you the German plurals, but it's madness. You, you don't want to do this. So uh, that's why we had to rewrite everything in English. Um, you can't get contributors if you do it in, in another language. Um, this is obvious to some people, but it wasn't to the person who wrote the original system. Uh, the second mistake we made, we were always on the bleeding edge and we did a whole lot of bleeding there. Uh, Ruby on Rails 1.0 came out in 2004, and Lies 1.0 came out in 2005, and that's silly. You, you don't do that. Uh, the reason you don't do that is if you do it, you can do it. it. It gets very exciting, and you get to do a lot of 
crazy things that the other people that use more mature platforms don't have to do. Uh, but this very scientific chart shows that you will spend half of your time just catching up to your platform and only the other half actually developing anything new. So that might not be what you want. Uh, additionally, there was a huge mess in the Ruby ecosystem. I'm just looking at this graph, it seems like, whoa. But uh, if you use always just the latest versions of everything, things were fine back then. But as soon as you start mixing versions, everything falls apart. Uh, we had one situation that when, uh, if you use a Rails that's too new on a Ruby that's too old, then Ruby gems won't work anymore. And um, at one point we had to tell people to downgrade all their Rubies to 1.9 and then upgrade all their Ruby gems to 1.3, but very carefully not upgraded beyond that because 1.4 would break everything again. Uh, but only on Ruby 1.9 and not on Ruby 2.0. So that was a mess, and that was just for installing things. It looked like roughly like this. Um, and once you had that, you had to still take care of hosting problems and stuff, so that wasn't included there. And nowadays we have a good ecosystem. Uh, we have things like Fusion Passenger. We have uh, Ruby Gems that doesn't just break every day as it used to. Um, so that's good. We got over that. Then we were arrogant enough to believe that we could add internationalization at a later point. And if you ever did that sort of stuff, you know that the one thing you cannot do with internationalization is add it at a later point. <laughs> <laughs> you can, but uh, you have to be prepared to go through all your code, and at least this is just piping stuff through GetTex. You have to do it this, but we had to do it 1,037 times. <laughs> and that's not even talking about date and time formats and that sort of thing. There's hundreds of date and time formats, there's many locales, and if you do Ruby on Rails, you get to do everything once in Ruby and then again in JavaScript. So happy times. Um, I think we lost maybe two months just internationalizing and everything. So you can skip that if you do it from the start. Um, then we started with no tests, which is stupid, but we did it. Um, then I heard about BDD and I wanted everybody to use RSpec. I don't see, ah yeah, you can see the arrow. I wanted everybody to use RSpec, but the pe people didn't see the point. And I wasn't happy and everybody wasn't happy and so we went back to no tests. Uh, <laughs> then the RSpec story runner came along, that's the predecessor to Cucumber for those of you who uh, know this sort of stuff. And uh, everybody got fascinated with the, the natural language uh, tests that you could do in it, but it was horribly buggy so we weren't happy. And uh, we weren't writing our stuff right either. So after that we kept running into more and more regressions and that meant more pressure to actually start doing tests. And uh, we used the combination of RSpec and Cucumber, like more or less, uh, but nobody really is. So. <laughs> then finally, our product owner, uh, she noticed that Cucumber can do this natural language stuff and she wanted to try specifying or writing the specs with us and uh, she did. So we went back to just using Cucumber, we dropped RSpec and everybody was like, eh. <laughs> um, because at this point, the tests took nine hours to run. <laughs> That's the only reason we weren't happy. Now thankfully, a guy working on our team, uh, he wrote his own CI system that does parallelized testing in his spare time. And the test execution, maybe I can go there. The test execution went from nine hours, processing time as you can see there, down to 23 minutes. And this is cool because it allows us to be really lazy and we don't have to optimize our test suite at all. We just fire it at, 20,000 euros of equipment and it just runs in 20 minutes. Uh, saves a lot of time. So if you want to have this sort of thing, um, our team member made it free software as well. And uh, this is not credited to the ZHDK at all. This has nothing to do with us except that this guy works for us as well. If you want this sort of thing, uh, that's where you can get it. So finally we had a reason to smile. But here's the next mistake. Uh, we started without having any user interface persons on the team. And uh, of course I know that programmers can design user interfaces, but the problem is that sometimes they end up looking like this. <laughs> or maybe something like this. This isn't that bad, it's just the color scheme and the weird icons, well. But it works, this is functional. Or there could be something like this, which is really confusing, it's not functional anymore. Or maybe something like that. Actually, this is maybe just a personal dislike. The big icons up there, they scare me. It's uh, weird. But it works. 
So, uh, and our interfaces were not better. I'm not, I'm not saying we did anything better or cleverer. The, I can't figure out what the fuck is going on in this screenshot anymore, even though this is from our own system. Uh, this was six or seven years ago in LIS2. And now this looks much more presentable because we had a user interface person. We redid the whole interface. Um, I'm not claiming it's the best ever, but it's an improvement. We had this in the back end where people managed uh, the equipment. It used to look like this. It has all sorts of confusing interface elements and it's now cleaned up and looks like that, much more presentable. Or we have uh, this thing where you actually hand something over to a person who ordered something from you. Uh, this looks like this now and you get uh, lots of error and problem indicators and stuff that people who work with this need. Or there's a calendar where you can select start and end dates. I mean, this what is this? It's green and scary. So the new one looks like this. And there's a lots, of, lots of numbers here, but it's good for the professionals who work with this. They understand the numbers. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not trying to criticize developers. But let's look at this typical Rails developer. He has a Lua book down there, but ignore it. Uh, I think it's a Rails developer. He needs to know a lot of things just to start developing uh, with Rails. So you have these many, many technologies. You have the asset pipeline, you have Ruby, Active Record, et cetera, et cetera. Then maybe you have some deployment uh, scripts. You have Capistrano. You need to know Bash and there's a little bit of Linux and stuff. So this is his world. And then add to that some of the stuff that a designer or that a user interface expert needs to know. You get more bubbles. And it's like bubbles everywhere. A whole lot of bubbles. And these are big topics. Graphic design, data visualization, that's big topics. It's not something you can just learn in a week. And uh, I mean, look at the poor guy. He's like pff, totally wrecked. So I think it makes more sense to split this into multiple people and to have just a user interface expert and an interaction design expert on the team. But, um, okay, another mistake. I thought I was finished with the mistakes, but no. Um, we did a lot of organization specific features. And if you look at this, which appears on every single edit screen of every single item, you might be uh, led to ask the question, who the fuck is Tony? Uh, this is Tony. This is uh, the new main building we moved to. It used to look like this and uh, it was a yogurt factory. So we should have said no, and we don't put that sort of thing there. And we should have looked for a more generic solution instead of implementing such a specific thing. And well, now the damage is done and it's in the vanilla system. So that's what we get for that. But enough about mistakes. Uh, maybe some hints about development life in general. Uh, first of all, doing good behavior driven design is really hard. And we found that it's really essential to create a glossary where the product owner and everybody else on the team agrees about the meaning of every single word you use everywhere. You have to agree on everything. There needs to be no confusion at all. That was really important. And that inevitably leads to extremely boring language. Uh, but that's what you need at that point because you cannot do BDD like this. And um, even with the boring version, you still have to define all of those terms. So finally, uh, management. Make sure that your management understands what they're signing up for when they ma make you manage a free software project. Because you need a good product owner. You need people who understand this, who, who know what free software is. And you need authorization to spend a whole lot of hours working with the community. You need to answer bug reports. You need to be on IRC channels. You need to blog. You need to uh, everything, social media, et cetera, marketing. You need time for that. And uh, you will spend more working on a FOSS project than you would working on just an internal project that scratches your own itch. Um, if you're a government organization like we are, I like to use this argument to still convince people to let you do FOSS projects because you're using taxpayer money, you're paid with taxpayer money, you bought your computers with taxpayer money, so give the taxpayers the software they paid for. It's, uh, I think it's immoral not to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, learn to say no, because there by far most features that people want to push into your software are not necessary and you don't need them. And you will end up with software that does too much in a very bad way instead of something properly. So learn to say no. But what you need is a very good solid vision of where you want your product to go, because uh, otherwise you're just being a jerk. Um, in summary, what I think you need to succeed are a, uh, sorry, I need to read this from here, a solid vision, 
a stable and reliable platform, remembering to do internationalization from the start, having some interaction designers on your team, having tests and a CI system, doing good community work, having an educated management that knows exactly what challenges you face and gives you just the right people to solve them, and you need to know when to say no. And what follows is great success. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have time for anything? I think we have uh, time for a few questions if you few want. Few questions, fantastic. Anybody has questions, raise your hands and the mic will be passed on to you. Oh, I see. Nope. Okay, well no you questions. can probably recognize me if you want to talk to me. Thank you very much, Ramon. Thanks.